everyone. Welcome back to my channel. This is Heidi from My Reading Life, and I'm here today to start my fourth vlog for the month of August, doing my 30 books in 30 days reading challenge. And it is August the 16th, and I finished another book yesterday. It was an audiobook that I had been listening to, um, and uh, the name of it is, I'm going to look down my notes because I've forgotten already, A Psalm for the Wild Bill. Uh, by Becky Chambers. This is book one in the Monk and Robot series. It is uh, a novella, science fiction novella. Um, it was narrated by M. Uh, M. Grossland, and it was an enjoyable audiobook, very much so. It is quite a gentle book, I would say. Um, this is not hard science fiction. This is more um, cozy science fiction, I guess. I don't know if that's really a thing, but that's what it felt like to me. So the premise is that in this world, humans created robots to run their factories and then at some point the robots gained their own consciousness and walked off the job and into the wilderness and never to be seen or heard from again for generations and generations and generations so that's the robot side of it the monk side of it is our main character dex he is a tea monk um, so he travels around and dispenses tea and advice to people and he is unsatisfied with his life. Um, and so he's off like sort of doing his own thing and encounters our robot character and they proceed to, um, you know, interact with one another. And so I don't want to go into it any more than that because it is quite a short book and I don't want to spoil anything, but I just found it lovely. It was just like a bomb for the soul. It was very, it's very much an exploration of, um, you know, what it means to live, what, what we're doing here on this world, like what we're doing with our lives. Um, it's a meditation on friendship and, and what we can mean to one another. Um, just really, really lovely and soothing and nice. So if you're interested in something like that, something that's sort of heartwarming and will make you feel good, I would definitely recommend um, A Psalm for the Wild Bill. It was lovely. So that is book number 16. So I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm feeling pretty pleased with my progress. I mean, it is, I finished that on the 15th. And so today is August 16th, as I said, so already um, 16 books down. So I'm keeping the pace up, which is great. Uh, I have my um, summer vacation is coming up at the end of this week. So I work this whole week. It's Monday, right? No, it's sorry. It's Tuesday right now. I work this whole week and then I am on my staycation week next week. So obviously should be able to get a lot of reading done at that point. So let's see how this next chunk of five books goes. August 17th um, and I will apologize in advance if you can hear the rain beating off the air conditioning unit right now because it is pouring rain outside. We are experiencing a rare nor'easter in August and it's quite windy and raining really hard and uh, which is good because we're in drought conditions so we needed the rain so I'm not going to complain about that but I'll just try to speak loudly so that you can hear me. So I wanted to check in because I have completed four books over the last about 24 hours. Um, three of which I w had on the go for a while. And then one that I read last night in the middle of the night while I had insomnia. So let's just talk about them, shall we? The first one is one that I've been reading for Women in Translation Month. It was a buddy read with Britta Bowler. And we just finished it up today. This is A Nation of Women by Luisa Capitillo. And it is translated by Alan Westeran. And this is An Early Feminist Speaks Out. So this is a compilation of Louis, 
Luisa Capitillo's writings. She was a woman who was born in Puerto Rico in the uh, late 1800s and wrote about issues relating to women in the early 1900s. And this is the first time that her works have been collected into this sort of penguin classic type thing. Um, and I think Capitillo was a very interesting woman. She came from a working class background. She espoused many ideas that for women were very unusual at the time, things like free love and, um, you know, that women should have the ability to choose, pick and choose what they wanted to do with their lives as far as work went. They, she, she felt that women should be able to work outside the home without being interfered with. Um, she felt that women should be able to choose their partners, their sexual partners, you know, based on their own, <laughs> their own ideas about that sort of thing. Um, so she is touted here in this collection as a feminist, but in some ways she was very traditionalist in her opinions. Uh, for example, she felt that women, I mean, she felt that um, people shouldn't have sexual relations except for the purpose of procreation. So even though she espoused women's right to pick their own partners based on, you know, their attraction to the man, she didn't, uh, she wasn't having any sort of, sex just for sex sake <laughs> kind of ideas. So yeah, she was a little bit uh, all over the place in her ideas. She didn't, she didn't conform to any one particular line of thinking and she didn't, she was in favor of suffrage for women, but she, that wasn't the thing that she was most focused on. She was most focused on women's right to work and women's right to get an education. So she was more concerned with class differences and the ability of women to make a living and support themselves. So very, very interesting. I will say those things were very interesting about Luisa Capitillo, but this collection was a hot mess. It was poorly organized. There were um, writings from other authors that were just put placed in here with no contextual information as to why they were in there or what the purpose was or how they played off Capitillo's writings. So that was very confusing. Um, there was a bunch of her like sort of postcards that she wrote to different individuals. We didn't have any context to know who those individuals were. So it just felt like we were reading somebody's private correspondence without any background information on that. Um, so just very weirdly organized. And there's a 50 page introduction to start this off. And yet the writings themselves are still poorly organized. So yeah, I say bad job Penguin on this one. And that does Luisa Capitillo a very grave disservice because she is one of the first Latinx writers writing about feminism from the Caribbean or South America. And so as such, she should be celebrated and her work should be held up and so that people can learn about it and know about it. And yet this collection is poorly put together. So yeah. And that's not what I expect from Penguin. I expect much better from Penguin. So that was a bummer. And then the next thing I completed was another Penguin Green Ideas book. This is number eight, The Clan of One-Breasted Women by Terry Tempest Williams. This is a collection of essays that Williams, you know, like five or six essays that uh, Williams wrote over the like several years. Um, I think the first one was, it says at the end of each essay when it was first published. So they, they range from like early 2000s all the way up to the current day. So it was a really good variety of essays from Williams. And her writing is just, I mean, she's just a fantastic writer. The way that she expresses herself is really beautiful. I've read um, her book, uh, I think it's called This Hour of Land, which is a book naturalist book club pick for later on this year, which is a collection of writings about uh, American national parks. So yeah, I really like her writing. And there were a couple of really standout essays in this, this small collection. The first one, The Clan of One-Breasted Women, which is like the titular essay, is about her experience. Um, the women in her family all have experienced breast cancer. And in fact, several women have passed away from breast cancer. And she is from the Western part of the United States, Utah, I believe. And so she ties together her family's experience with breast cancer and the nuclear testing that occurred out West in the United States during the middle part of the 20th century. Um, and what it's like to live in an area that the, the government of your country has deemed, um, you know, 
that not enough people live there to care that they're blowing up nuclear bombs in it and like very very powerful essay like wow blew me i mean that's an unfortunate um <laughs> analogy but it was it was very eye opening that first essay uh so then there was some other ones that were also really great um one about uh trying to advocate to keep the arctic national wildlife refugee free from exploratory oil drilling during the um i think during the bush administration the second bush administration and she travels to the arctic and like writes about what she experiences in the arctic and talks about why it's important that we continue to have these spaces that are kept as wilderness and where you don't do exploration for fossil fuel extraction so yeah just love this love this i love terry tempest williams she's so amazing and uh, i'm really glad that i read this one and then I read another book for women in translation. This is Cockroaches by Scholastic Mukusanga. This is translated from the French by Jordan Stump. And this is a memoir. Uh, Mukusanga grew up in Rwanda. She was born in, I believe, in the 60s. And she, uh, her family was um, pushed out of Rwanda and into like sort of a lands adjacent to the actual country of Rwanda where they lived in like these what to call them um areas that these no man land kind of areas where um her family was uh Tutsi and the ruling Hutu uh group like sort of forced all these Tutsi people to live in these certain areas and they couldn't live outside of these areas and they were very much persecuted and her family was extremely poor um and so like she describes her childhood growing up in these in this situation and she ends up um testing so well that she is given an opportunity for further schooling advanced schooling which is like very very rare for people in her situation like she is one of like a handful of Tutsi uh, children that are allowed to continue on with their education um, as teenagers and her family sort of like places their hopes on her as like one member of their family that maybe can get out of this situation and live like get a chance to live um, and so she does end up uh, being forced out of Rwanda and going to Burundi and continuing her education and eventually marries a man and moves to France and in the meantime, her family continues to be caught up in the violence against Tutsis in Rwanda and are her, like, I can't remember, dozens and dozens of her family members are killed off in the 1994 um, genocide. I can't remember the exact number of her family, 27, 27 members of her family are killed, murdered during the genocide in 1994 many of whom she does not where their body doesn't know where their bodies are um so so powerful this book is so powerful and so well written and while it details like not like there are horrible things that happen in this book like absolute atrocities like things that will make you weep they're so heartbreaking and horrific but yet uh mukasanga just writes her life story in such a engaging way such a heartfelt way i was enthralled reading this book it was so such a wonderful book to read I was like right there with her you know as she's she goes to school and endures the bullying that she endures like not just from this other students but from the teachers and like when she finally does encounter kindness and what that's like and like her worry for her family and her her discussion of each of her siblings and what they were like and oh it's just wow amazing like I am so thankful that this book was first brought to my attention by Sean the Book Maniac and then I saw Anna over at uh, Anna Wallace Johnson talk about it more recently and it just reminded me how much I wanted to read this book and I'm so glad that I finally did purchase a copy of it and read and I've read it now it is fabulous 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 I know it is a tough subject matter to talk about the Rwandan genocide but I think that this book is just well worth your time it's really well written really um emotionally impactful and i can't you know praise it highly enough and then last but not least last night while i was suffering from insomnia i finished another green ideas book this is number nine this is food rules by michael pollan and this was first published i think in 2000 and 
nine or 10, somewhere around that. I actually had read this before. I don't know if I read it like as a magazine article or what. I've read several books by Michael Pollan. He is very well known author of um, books about food, particularly about local food and the local food movement and eating, um, you know, eating more naturally and, you know, less processed foods and like all that sort of thing. So the, the tagline for this book is eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And this book, all this book is, is like his basically like talking about how he was doing the research for in defense of food and he needed to write an article or something for uh, some other kind of outlet. And that was what this turned out to be. And it is like 64 rules for eating. And so each page basically is a rule. And some of them are like very short, like this one. And then some of them are a little bit longer. Um, like these are very, very short ones. And then some are a little bit longer like these ones. And so this was kind of a reread for me. I'm pretty sure I've read all of the material that's in this little book um, previously. But I think that there are some really good things to remember in here. Like when you go to the grocery store, try to avoid the middle aisles. You know, only focus your attention on purchasing food from the outer ring of the grocery store. I mean, this is very specific to the United States, obviously, because that's where the produce and the... Um, stuff that's not processed is located uh and if you're if you are buying more uh processed food like only buy things in which you can actually pronounce all the ingredients that are listed on, in the ingredients labels don't don't buy things that have you know long lists of chemicals <laughs> listed in the ingredients um eat mostly plants if you can um try to limit your intake of of meat um, these sorts of things, you know, these are great recommendations that anyone should really probably pay attention to. So yeah, uh, glad that I had this little reminder, refresher from reading Food Rules by Michael Pollan. So that is book, these were book 17, 18, 19, and 20 um, in my 30 books in 30 days challenge. So that is the end of this vlog. I hope you're all doing well and finding some great books to read and I will talk to you later.